Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bird Whisperer radio show, coming to you live from the Congaree National Park in beautiful South Carolina, USA. We're going to be discussing the wonderment, the beauty, and the awesomeness of our beautiful, beautiful feathered companions. We're also going to have fantastic guests on to share their beautiful moments, experiences, and perhaps maybe a little bit of help and advice to come your way to make your relationship between you and your bird so much better. We'll be right back. We would like to extend a sincere thank you to Tom Rowdybush, the creator of Rowdybush Foods. Find out the reasons Rowdybush Food is the right choice for keeping your birds healthy and happy. When nutrition is important, Rowdybush Premium Foods are second to none. Rowdybush Incorporated manufactures specialized bird foods. This manufacturing is a result of research by an avian nutritionist Tom Rowdy Bush. During his 16 years of nutritional research in the Department of Avian Sciences at the University of California, Davis, Tom studied a variety of birds, including 10 years of research on the nutritional requirements of companion birds. Mr. Rowdy Bush has generated most of the published nutritional research in pet birds. As far as pellets are concerned, Rowdy Bush is what we feed our flock exclusively here at the Global Nest Exotic Bird Sanctuary. You can order from them direct. It's Rowdy Bush, R-O-U-D-Y-B-U-S-H dot com. Their telephone number is 1-800-326-1726. Thank you. Folks, we'd like to welcome Bobby Courtright, who happens to work with FeatheredFriendsForever.org. It happens to be the largest parrot rescue and sanctuary in the United States. Hello, Bobby. How's everything out there in uh, the global nest? Hey, we're nesting, man. We're doing awesome. Just got done giving all the babies treats. They're about ready to take their naps. And believe it or not, uh, it's actually quiet here now. Um, doesn't happen often, but uh, yeah, we've got uh, delicious silence. Um, waiting in the background so to speak but it's not going to last forever <laughs> bobby i know that you're really busy and you must you know you, you must be with all the wonderful work that you do with birds and thank you so very very much for being with us tonight my pleasure all right first of all um i'd like to ask you if you would could you please share with us what feathered friends forever is all about please this is the largest nonprofit rescue and sanctuary in America. It was founded 20 years ago. Hi, Sugar. I've just been joined by Sugar, my grow up, back to who decided she wants to be part of this conversation. Uh, Ron Johnson founded it 20 years ago, and uh, he started out with just six birds, and as every other hobby that turns into a business, so to speak, he's now at about 1,400. Um, there's 53 species from 43 states, including Alaska, some psyches one and two endangered. And, uh, of course, the majority, as with any rescue, are the result of breeders and pet resellers that care more about the dollar than the bird. And then a number of people that have changes in their life, uh, deaths in the family, divorce, things like that, where they can no longer... Uh, you know, provide the proper environment for their feathered companions. What what is it? What's uh, describe for us, if you will? What what is the sanctuary like? Uh, kind of paint a picture for us. Uh, a, a number of aviaries. The birds are out. They're in flocks. They're in groups. Uh, uh, sectioned off. Things of that nature. Kind of paint a picture for us, so we can kind of get an idea of what it looks like for those that have not visited yet. The um, the site is. It's in uh, beautiful downtown Harlem, Georgia, uh, which is famous for Oliver Hardy being born there. And uh, it's on 10 acres, seven of which are cleared and being improved. Also just acquired a three acre site next door, which is gonna be uh, set up for parking and some other events. There's 
20 outdoor aviaries that are mixed species. Um, then we have the main building and the porch area, which is home to all the birds that need to be in single cases because uh, they're not compatible in flocks or their special needs. Uh, for whatever reason, they, they can't be out with a flock or some that have been out there and have either been picked on or been too aggressive and uh, they end up in there until we open up another flight or another aviary depending on your frame reference. Uh, currently under construction is a very big uh, outdoor unit from a cause. It's a uh, 12 foot high sidewall. I think it's uh, 18 to 20 feet wide and about 40 feet long. And it's going to have as close to a natural environment in there as we can make. There'll be infrared heat for the winter time, uh, mist cooling for the summertime, and then a uh, little pond for them to play in, and then trees. Um, it's actually a, a tree concept where you use two by fours on a replaceable platform. <clears throat> so they can climb on what you want them whenever, and then uh, go back in with, with other, un, you know, uh, just untreated lumber. So that's in the construction stage right now. Um, the other aviaries that are the newer ones out there all do have heat, water, and pond. And there's two or three of the older style that's currently upgrading um, and to move those birds into a new flight. There's also a 13,000 gallon bio pond out there that takes the water from the individual ponds, <clears throat> runs it into a this big pond where the carp or koi, depending on your frame of reference, delete all the solids, and then this goes through a sand and UV filter system, as well as some natural plant filtration, to provide very clean drinking and clay water to go be pumped back up the hill to the uh, little individual ponds. Uh, then the misting systems, that comes right off direct off well water, that gets filtered and goes through, um, I think it's six micron jets, where it's turned into a very fine mist, of course, evaporative cooling is used everywhere, and it dropped the temperature inside in the neighborhood of 15 degrees in the summertime. Wow. It's my understanding, too, that you are the key integer in designing a lot of these things out there that they use regarding the aviaries, the heat, the misting, <clears throat> and all of it, that, that you pretty much are the architect, if you will, and coming up with some really very innovative and fantastic things to create more comfort for birds, right? Well, sort of. Um, you know, Ron, he's a former Marine, a former Army. Uh, Larry is another veteran out there. But uh, Ron pretty much had his hands full when I started helping him about 13 years ago. Um, he was pretty much using the materials and finances he had on hand. Being an engineer, uh, I used some other means to achieve things that he didn't know he needed, such as infrared heat. So I went and got some units, and we put them in and found out how well they worked and just proliferated that. The mist going actually came about when I was in a grocery store, and the spray that they have comes out over top of the vegetables. Um, happened to get me wet, and I thought, oh, wow, what a neat idea. And we got some of that, and then... Um, taken that and proved that now to where we have the actual little novels and uh, a certain number of those per square foot. And uh, <clears throat> that's pretty much, you know, it, it's nothing special, just happened to come up with the right idea at the right time to help the birds. I think it's very, very special, Bobby, because, you know, the misting thing, first of all, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a major treat for them, especially during the warmer months, uh, you know, it, 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 it creates a comfort zone for them, uh, as opposed to just sitting out there, you know, depending upon what the weather is. It could be extremely humid, really hot. And then the infrared heating for the winter time, so they can still enjoy being outdoors and looking around. Uh, tell me this, if with the aviaries where they are and their view, they pretty much just see trees and, 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 and forest and things of that nature, not a housing track and all of that, but just kind of like free, open, beautiful space for them to be able to witness 24-7? Well, they can see on one side, um, they can see, you know, the trees, and uh, they can also see the 
other aviaries. So they are in communication with other birds. Uh, it's not like they're you know, stand alone and isolated. Well, as they would be in the wild, there's another uh, flock in another tree, you know, just across the path. Uh, and then, of course, with the, with the walk paths we have and the vehicle paths, whenever we're you know, doing tours out through there, they get to see you know, the people coming and going and interact with them as well. Oh, so you do tours. The rescue is open uh, normally on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, from 11 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. Uh, admission is by donation. All donations are tax deductible. It's a 501c3 and 509 registered nonprofit. Okay. Uh, we have a welcome center when you get there. You come in and sign in. And uh, you can do a walk through tour with a map. We have people to walk with you and or for some of the people that uh, don't want to negotiate the hill and the outer terrain is we have golf cars. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well that that's that yeah, long go ahead. Long term in, in this newest renovation stage, we've actually allowed as we put in the flights, uh, we're actually planning ahead to allow people, especially seniors or, or you know, impaired, mobility impaired individuals, the ability to take their car down there, you know, to go in between these flights so you can actually drive up to the area, get out, look at the birds, get back in, uh, which is very handy for people that are, as I said, mobility impaired or if they can't tolerate, you know, the outdoor heat, they can stay in their air conditioned car and still interact with the birds. Well, like going to the drive-in, huh? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And the speakers, you don't have to add a speaker. The birds will provide that audio. Oh, uh, I can that. only imagine the drive-in speaker of life, you know, and the birds going, <laughs> snack bar closes in <laughs> 15 minutes, squawk. <laughs> well, we've got, you know, then we've got one like Casper that, you know, going to talk to you and call you and make sure you, you know, come over and interact with him personally. Who is Casper? Casper is a self-protested topic. One of the, he's been there a little longer than I have. Uh, very, very intelligent bird, very interactive, and he's the one that turned an autistic boy from being a total introvert into a tour guide two years later. Casper was a catalyst. That is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Wow, I, I would write. I would really like you to take a few moments here and reflect on that for us, of how he was about. He was able to take and do this. Um, well, we were the, um, the young man was about sixteen. He was a high school student, and his his parents would drop him off on Saturday. He would come out, and he loved animals. He had a little conure of his own. And he would go out and help clean cages and do that, but he never talked to anybody. He never interacted with any of the other volunteers out there. And he would, when he would get done, he would come in to the main building. He would just sit in a chair and stare at the floor until his mom came to pick him up. Well, I had Casper out just before Casper went into a flight. And uh, Casper was sitting on my arm, and he kept looking. The boy's name was Owen. He kept looking at Owen, and, and he kind of looked at me and looked at Owen and gave me that sign, like, watch what I can do. <clears throat> so I said, Owen, can you hold Casper? I have to go outside. And um, I got him to hold his arm up. Casper jumped right on his arm. And I said, now, if you move your arm, Casper will sing. So, of course, on cue, Casper started doing his act. And I walked outside, stood out by the back door for about five minutes, and walked back in, kicked Casper up. Owen's mom came. Mind you, to this point, he'd not spoken a single word. Uh, a week later, he's back out on Saturday, sitting there in the chair when he's all done. Mr. Bob, man, please play with Casper. Aww. That broke the ice. Uh, it progressed to him coming in, getting Casper out of the cage, playing with him for about 10 minutes, and then go doing uh, what you know what he was going to do with the birds, out clean up and stuff like that. And then we moved him into outdoors, working with Ron and I, doing you know guy stuff. Um, and he, as he got more comfortable and we made him interact with people more, uh, he, we started letting him do tours. And the, one, the, the neatest part about this was the uh, most autistics cannot make eye contact. And I worked with him for a number of weeks to actually do that. So when he 
introduced himself. He could look at you, and, you know, actually look at you. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. So they're back in Texas, and he's, I think, he's working at um, another animal facility down there. So it's a very, very happy ending success story. That's fantastic because you know what comes to mind. I mean, autism. I mean, it's 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 a, you know, it's it's still you know a, a real mystery in in many different ways. But the cool part about this is that perhaps where people weren't able to take and reach this young man, a bird, and I say that with respect, a bird was able to take and break through that veil of confusion and bring this man's spirit and his heart back out so that he could actually revel in, in, in actually having another day. The bird was able to do this, peeps, and that's just, that's just fantastic. The more, I, the more I, I, I speak with people like yourself, Bobby, and others, that have shared with me some of the amazing things that birds are capable of doing for people is is it's it's more than 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 uh, several thousands of hours that I, that I would take up on this show sharing this information, but the coolest part about all of it, not to be redundant here, is all the bird has to do is just to be who he or she is. She's, it gives being a natural a, a whole new meaning. I also realized that for a lot of uh, uh, army veterans, not arm, well, ser- soldier veterans, so to speak, you know, that have PTSD, that have gotten a, a parrot, and has helped them basically to to regain uh, their their self worth, if you will. Uh, the bad dreams begin to dissipate. Uh, they've got a buddy. It's not a person. They've got a buddy and they're able to take and communicate uh, with heart. So it really doesn't matter what's in your head. Uh, they, they, they do it all with their spirit, they do it with their heart, they read your heart in a heartbeat, and they're there to help us and to give back. And I think, I think it's absolutely fantastic. That's awesome that you did that, Bobby. That is awesome. I applaud you, sir. Actually, that was all my Casper. The uh, follow-up to that story, is in this area, all the high school students have to do a senior project, which is basically a mini master's thesis type deal. Uh, they have to do an oral presentation and uh, a video on screen, PowerPoint type thing. And Sugar's helping explain this. That's what's in the background. And uh, we took Boo Boo, another cockatoo, and she said one that travels with me a lot. And she did his presentation on his shoulder and was translating what he was saying into cockatoo for the judges. Uh, <laughs> his, uh, his presentation had a 10 minute window. He was nine minutes, 48 seconds. And um, it, it was the interaction that he had with, with the bird and the bird's interaction with the judges who would, you know, been sitting there watching high school senior girls tie a neckerchief around the dog's neck. And this is how you make your dog look like he's wearing a costume or, this is how you make a double layer cake. And uh, I got to see, because I had bird, I got to sit in the back and watch, which is not usually allowed. Uh, it was really interesting to see how they interacted together. And it gave only uh, just another rock, you know, in his stable, the ability to, you know, he had that reassurance on his shoulder. And uh, he got a 98 out of 100. That's awesome. So. Yeah, he did. They're doing very well. He's in Texas. His father's in the military, um, and they moved back to San Antonio. So, and I did hear from him occasionally. Hi, Oscar. I'm wondering, um, have you by any chance? Uh, this just a thought that just came to my mind, and that is that, um, like, there's a, a, several different autism centers across the country that might possibly be open to the idea of per- perhaps introducing parrots or birds to some of we their... We have one here, and I've already been in contact with them. And? Uh, well, we're... It, the, there's so many legal issues involved right now because it's children um, that they have to get clearance, you know, for their corporate legal department through the parents. Uh, you know, I just volunteered to bring one of the birds out there and do a show and tell day. And they were all for it. But again, the, you know, the system, uh, with, you know, I want to say the witch hunt on anybody that says anything about children right now, they have to be cognizant of that. So it's in the works and I'll let 
you know, you know how that works out. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, next Tuesday, Boo Boo and I are going to go over to uh, Brandon Wild, which is a very large uh, retirement facility here, and uh, she's been invited over to entertain some of the residents there. They do what they call a vendor day, and these folks get all dressed up and you know they get their wheelchairs and they take them down and you know there's snacks. And things like this, and uh, who's going to go in there and uh, entertain them again? That that's fantastic. You know what, my brother? Thanks for being on the planet and doing what you do. You know, every time we talk, peeps, uh, Bobby is 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 a brother to me. I, I love him dearly, and he's always coming up with these fantastic ideas to make people feel better and using the prop of bird if you will to drive the message home bless your heart for what you do my brother bless your heart that's that's well thank you you know it's 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 really pretty simple you just you know there's a couple of basic guidelines for life if you follow me. and one of them that, that i try to follow is every day you want to learn something and every day you want to teach something and i can always learn something from one of these parents and it gives you the opportunity when you're out among people to teach, especially younger people, you know, to teach them something. And then, you know, another one is compliment someone, you know, random act of kindness. Um, you're walking through uh, a store or something like this, and you see an individual, like, you know, like a lady, an elderly lady, and she's got very nice hair or something like that. You know, of course, you risk getting punched in this day and age. But, you know, <laughs> That's what it's about. That's that's the kind of heart that Bobby Courtright has, peeps. You know, uh, reveling in another day in our universe and doing something with the, the the magic and the beauty and the love that he has within his spirit and within his heart. I want to switch gears for a second here. I want to ask you this. People out there that are listening uh, to the show tonight and becoming aware of FeatheredFriendsForever.org. How can people reach out to help? Well, there's a, a number of ways you can do it. Um, people that are in the, you know, in the area can always stop by to visit. It's uh, about 20 minutes west of Augusta, Georgia, and about two hours east of the Atlanta airport, right off of Interstate 20. Um, so if you're coming into town for the Masters or something like that, you know, come by and visit. If you're there during the week, um, call up the, the rescue and, and make an appointment. There's usually somebody there. There's no big formal tours or anything, but you sure can come out and meet Ron and, and some of the birds. Uh, the month of May is all construction because on June 9th is the annual, what we call the Ethnic Food Fest. We've got a number of different folks that cook a variety of dishes and, uh, I think there's 11 different ones right now, and they all come out, and the food's all free. It's just, you know, a donation, as you feel, uh, that you might want to contribute. And we're going to have, in addition to uh, just the food, we're going to have a DJ there. We've got music. We've got the birds. Uh, we're going to have uh, a couple, let's just, just say some special guests that we don't want to talk about right now and ruin the surprise. We've got some other people coming in that have been invited uh, that do something similar to what we do. There's a, uh, a group that provides service animals for veterans. Uh, they've been invited out. And, uh, you know, we'll see who shows up. But uh, that's June 9th, and it's going to start around 10 in the morning. And, you know, we run out of food early in the afternoon, so get there early. Uh, okay. That's, that's it. If you have those folks that are in this area, if you have a Kroger card, Kroger grocery store, you can go on your account, go to the community page and put Feathered Friends Forever in as your charity. Every time you use your Kroger card, the store chain makes a donation transparent to you. You can go to the website, FeatheredFriendsForever.org. On the home page, there's a, a tab for the affiliate mall. Click on that. If you shop at Walmart and another number of stores, if you go through that 
gateway if you log into Feather Friends and then you click on, let's say, Walmart, and you log in that way, every time you make a purchase online, they credit back toward the rescue. Uh, so what we tell people to do is, you know, okay, you've got free shipping over $35, so log in to Feather Friends, log in to your Walmart account, or $35 worth of parent food and have it shipped to Feather Friends. That's <laughs> you this how can someone now, become a volunteer there what are the what, um, what, what are your guidelines somebody wants to come out they want to <laughs> feed the birds they want to clean the cages they want to interact with the birds and all uh, what is your guidelines how are they screened well we check in with people we, we like to have um, we do a lot with teenagers we do an awful lot with community service and a lot with military when you're on temporary duty or TDY now you need to do what they call community service hours and we'll get folks in here uh, with Air Force, Navy, Army that come into Fort Gordon for training and we're, we've become the fun place to go. Uh, we'll get it anywhere from four to, to 20 military folks and they will come out and they'll just pick a project like you know clean up an area or something and it's military, it doesn't matter what the weather is, it's military precision. They come out, they have a ball doing it, and they get to meet the birds and spend, you know, we'll spend some time with them and teach them about the place. If their schedule permits, we'll cook lunch, you know, hot dogs and stuff. And uh, just really expose people to something that they would never see otherwise. Wow. Um, and potential, and I, pot potential parrot owners after they get out of the military, too, when they've been exposed to them. Uh, up close and personal, so to speak. So, it's uh, and the other thing that, that we have is is parent owners that are in the military uh, that get deployed overseas. Is we have, we are a military deployment center. You can drop your bird off at Feathered Friends, fill out the paperwork, and we'll take care of him or her until you get back from overseas. That's awesome. That is that is totally That's really, awesome. Uh, appreciated because the birds cared for um we've got some that you know when they want them out in a free flight area and some that are you know, obviously individually caged um we also does ron has, has done a fantastic job over the years of helping parent owners around pretty much around the world to have health issues with their birds where they've been able to call him and he you know especially the weekends or you know off hours when they can't reach a veterinarian uh, or they don't have an avian vet nearby, he's been able to help them uh, with their birds' issues. Well, he's that knowledgeable then regarding veterinary medicine and uh, with parrots. Well, 20 years and 1,400 birds, yeah, that's probably more than any avian vet in the country that we're going to see. I love your sense of humor. <laughs> All right, let me ask you this. What are your guidelines now for someone who comes to your sanctuary, i.e. rescue, and is interested in adopting a bird? That's the easy one. Uh, on one side of the page, there's, on the website, there's a, an application blank. It's about four pages of questions. We're pretty picky with that. Um, there's, Good. There's things about the environment of the house, other pets, other kids, and things like that. People get the idea that, you know, that they'll watch the videos of Sugar here dancing to Thunderstruck or, you know, playing Catch the Easter Bunny and, boy, I want a cockatoo. Well, when you've got, you know, a 
I like it. Uh, we, we prefer people to come out and actually come out a couple of times, volunteer for, you know, a couple of weekends and help out and understand. They, they understand what the mess is, what the noise is, what the issues are, you know, food, water, and stuff like that. Uh, so they're better prepared. Plus, if they do it over a couple of weekends, they get to work with the bird a couple of different times. And as we all know, every 30 days, everything changes. Uh, it's the same in the bird world as it is in the human world. The, uh, the exception is the males get to talk more than the females in the bird world. So, <laughs> they say males, girls, I, I love women, you know, we're just even. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's the same with volunteers. We like them to come out, um, sign up so we have your name, address. It sounds silly, but it's next to Kim. Uh, don't worry about the blood type. One of the birds will tell you that if you're not careful. And we like them to be, you know, teenagers and above. Uh, okay. Community service is fine. And uh, it's kind of interesting because I'll meet people when I'm out and about with, let's say, Google on my shoulder, and they, they talk about volunteering. And I said, well, we have a very stringent test. Okay, are you right hand or left hand? I'm right hand. As long as you see your right hand, I'll grab your hand and I'll squeeze as hard as you can. And I'll shake your hand and say, congratulations, you're a volunteer. And I'll show up and fill out the paperwork. <laughs> and they all love it. We actually have some people do that. Wow. Well, what I like uh, that you said earlier was that, and it's kind of, I had, <clears throat> excuse me, Debbie Huckabee on our show last week, and she mentioned that um, the criteria regarding adopting a bird, that the bird has to pick the people, yep. you know, and, and that's, that's to me, when she said that, I went, you know what, yeah, that's the way to do it, you know, and you guys are doing the same thing, and uh, that, that's smart, it's intelligent, and well, in, in the 20 years Ron has been doing this, I think he's had five birds come back that were not perfect fit type adoptions. Um, and that was based on one, one or two of them were people that just plain did not listen. Okay, that bird does not like women, but it likes me. He does not like women, and the guy was a, a hairstylist. And it did his girlfriend. Okay, well, we told you. And then another lady, you know, there's, there's a very firm set of guidelines when you introduce that bird into your home, what to do, okay, how long to leave the bird in the cage, you know, to get oriented to the environment and stuff like this. Well, they brought the bird home, put it in the cage, opened the door, and let the bird in with a cockatoo and let them out, and the kids are all running around, you know, barefoot, you know, yelling and screaming, and because they got a new, you know, a new pet, well, little tiny toes are little tiny targets. You know, and they didn't make the whole day. And the bird, and this is this is what I do. You know, I'm going to come out and play with your kids. And uh, they just did not listen. But other than that, the majority of them uh, are you know, award-winning adoptions. Let me ask you this. You mentioned about, you know, the, the, the time frame that it takes when somebody gets a bird and they bring him home and they put them in the cage. I like to call them apartments, okay? But um, you put them in their apartments. Um, what is the recommended time frame that... Now, we're talking about people that aren't necessarily going to be adopting a bird from your organization, but somebody that goes to another rescue, somewhere within the United States, somewhere within the world, of what you would recommend a good time frame for the bird to remain in the cage to get acclimated basically to the environment the people that live in the home uh, other animals possibly as well is there a time frame that you would recommend to most people that pretty much they could rely on to get a really good feel of doing it right minimum of 72 hours make sure that the bird has plenty of food plenty of fresh water i mean you know most of the cages have outdoor access you know external access doors mm -hmm. talk to him okay you know but don't have the kids running around like it's a zoo exhibit. Okay, let everybody just leave him alone, put him where he's going to be. Don't, don't put him in a bedroom and then have to move him you know, later on. Put him where he's going to be, where he's going to interact. And just don't you know, pay a little bit of attention to him, but don't make a big fuss. Let him sit there and quietly become part of the environment. Okay, then after that, just, just open the, if you're going to have the bird come out, assuming you know he's family friendly, open the door and just back up and let him come out. The wings are always trimmed, the nails are done before he leaves. 
back in, you know, teach you to go back in at night. Uh, okay. Don't, don't cover your cases. This is um, somewhere, somewhere in the past, along with round, circular, cylindrical cages, somebody thought covering birds was a good idea, uh, especially cockatoos and cockatiels, because of the dander on their feathers. Um, you can entirely cover a cage and suffocate your bird in its own dander. They don't need to be covered. Um, they're going to make noise at night because they want to continue to play with their family. It's a matter, just like the two-year-old, it's a matter of you know educating them and getting used to it. That's, um, that's really good input, Bobby, because I, I never have covered any of my babies in the 46 years that I've been doing it, but I never really considered suffocating on their own dander. The thing that came to mind for me was that if they're covered and they hear noises around them or what's going on in the house in the middle of the night and things of that nature and they're not able to actually be able to see what it is could could absolutely enhance the stress factor for them and really 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 ruin their sleep more than benefit it by covering them so that's an interesting point that you brought up regarding uh their own dander as well i had never considered that as i said i considered that you know the uh the being covered up and hearing noises and stuff and having no idea what in the world it is even for myself i mean that would freak me out man you know well you know Nowhere in nature does this giant cover come down over a tree with a flock of birds in it at night. You know, it's you, you want to give this bird as much of a natural, you know, in the wild environment as possible in a domestic area. Okay, they don't cover the trees at night. Uh, you know, there's food for them 24/7. Food and water. People get on a on a feeding schedule. My guys, you know, there's always food in the bowl. Uh, unless sugar throws it out, and then, you know, about lunchtime we'll have some more. The, um, the other thing we'll talk about food, let me mention one very, very important and little-known fact about food. Uh, birds all love fruits and vegetables and mac and cheese and pizza. Be, be very, very careful with fruit, especially during this time of the year that's imported. Do not feed your parrots any fruit that comes from places like Chile, Central America, okay? Grapes are a favorite from down there. The reason is, in America, we topically treat our plants with pesticides. The majority of that, almost all of it, washes off in the multiple processing stages. When you go down to these Central American countries, they treat the soil. They put the pesticide in the soil, the plant picks it up so it's in the leaves, so when the caterpillar eats the leaf, the caterpillar eats poison. Unfortunately, it also goes into the fruit. So when your bird eats the grapes, uh, their little bodies can't metabolize that type of insecticide, and it never has a good outcome. So make sure all, all the fruits and vegetables that you feed your birds are raised in the U.S. Be careful not packaged in the U.S., but raised, you know, grown in America. Yes, sir. Okay, is, and then the other thing is, is of course, avocados and chocolate are the two things that are poisonous to parrots. Right. Is Mexico also included in this scenario? They're a little better. Um, I, tend, I tend to just stick with, you know, everything's coming out of California and Florida almost all year round. Uh, you'd have to research Mexico. I just prefer, you know, supporting America. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that as well, too. I, it's like there's another one of those instances where I follow my heart instead of my head. If my heart isn't 100% sure, then listen to your heart, man. You know, listen, right. listen to your heart and, and, and do it right. Um, let me ask you this. If someone finds themselves in the position of having to give up their bird, what is required by Feathered Friends Forever to offer a home to them? Because of the, the current population uh, of having to raise close to $600 a day from private donations, all birds coming in now have to have a, uh, a support contract. In other words, it costs us X number of dollars a day to care for that bird. Uh, so if you're going to put him there, you know, we have trusts and things like that for the birds and credit card payments, but we have to be assured that, you know, 
first loan to be adoptable that he's supported until he gets adopted, or if he's a permanent resident that he's supported for you know his natural lifespan, which can be a hundred years for some of these guys. Let me ask you this: Is it very expensive, or does it depend upon the species of the bird, or, or how, how how do you do this? How do you govern this? It, it, it depends on it depends on the bird, and the best way you know with that is just to contact Ron. And I think all the the majority of the rescues you mentioned, Debbie, down in Florida at Fox, you know, she has the same thing in place. Um, we have more parrots. Parrots are the second most, I want to say, discarded. You have your dog, cat, you know, shelters and things like that. Yes, sir. That's an animal with a 12 to 15 year lifespan. Okay. Uh, then you get parrots with an 80 to 100 year lifespan that, uh, you know, is right up there with people that have a bird for two years and it made noise, bit my, you know, bit me, bit somebody, it made a mess, you know, my girlfriend doesn't like the bird, etc. There's all kinds of reasons people give up parrots. Uh, so, you know, they, they have to be supported someplace this money has to come from to feed that bird. That makes sense. It, that's good business and also, uh, yeah, you want to make sure that you've got the, 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 the resources to feed them, to water them, the people basically to be able to take care of them. Let me ask you this. Say hypothetically someone wants to give up their bird. They they need they don't want to, but they have they found themselves in a situation where they have to give up their bird, whether it be health or who knows what and all. Hardship, but, right. Yeah, hardship. Good one. Thank you. Uh, but they do not want the bird to be adopted out. They would like to be able to have the bird stay there at your rescue, basically, so that, you know, they're thinking to themselves, um, you know, it, it, the bird will make other friends and things of that nature there of other birds and all. Do you have a policy in which uh, birds can actually come there and, and live out their lives without being adopted out or offered for adoption? It's called permanent resident. Yes, we do. Uh, there's a number of them there. KT, uh, a few others. There's also birds that are there that, let's say, the, it's the daughter's bird and she's off to college for, you know, four to six years and the parents, you know, traveling or something like that. You know, as long as that bird is the support is maintained financially, that's your bird, you know, uh, and, you know, they'll do everything they can to care for that bird until you return. Uh, how, you know, however, you know, if the payments stop, you know, and the bird is not supported, Ron will try to contact them a couple of times, and we've had people just basically, you know, stop. At that point, the bird is becomes uh, one of the rescue birds and is el eligible for adoption. Okay. Uh, yeah, but now if you, you know, the permanent placement thing, is in place out there, uh, and it is set up by contract, and it's set up, uh, you know, with permanent payment plan and everything else. We have a number of Caspers as a prime example of that. Um, the family that had him out there, they love him to death, but he bites women. And, you know, her, the, the uh, wife's arm is all bite, you know, little bite scars from Casper. They love him to death, but, you know, he just... He's a guy bird, and he wants to be flirts like crazy. The best sport, tell you what, he can give lessons on, on talking to girls. But as soon as you know, they go, they go to pet him, you know, oh, you're so nice, you love me, bam. So, um, yeah, there, he's a permanent resident out there, and he's supported, you know, all the time. Um, and they've also adopted a couple other birds. That's awesome. That's uh, awesome because a, no has that. a number of people have contacted me looking for places that you know, uh, regarding health, or they're getting on in their years and things of that nature, and wondering whether or not I'm aware of, a, you know, any rescues or sanctuaries that would actually have, take care of their birds, but not adopt them out, that they will, they will have a forever home, and that's, peeps, that's a really, really good thing to note, if you're considering, uh, if you're getting on in your years, or or perhaps you're, you're you're going through some health issues and things of that nature that's getting a little freaky for you, and you're concerned about your bird. Well, here's a resource for you. Okay, FeatheredFriendsForever.org. Um, that's that that's awesome. That's awesome to be able to offer that to to, to people that 
um, pretty much, you know, you become lost sometimes. And my God, you know, here I'm, I'm getting older. Here I've got these health problems and stuff. And what in the world am I going to do with my bird? Is somebody else going to take my bird and, and treat it horribly? Is it going to have the love and the attention that I've given it and all of it? And featheredfriendsforever.org peeps, okay, is out there waiting to give you a hand. Bobby, I want to ask you this. Uh, personally, what prompted you to have an interest in birds to begin with? I've always been interested in them. Uh, when I was younger, I was, you know, very young, like high school range, looking at, you know, falconing and things like that. It would just look to be kind of an interesting interaction in the avian community. Um, and then a girlfriend that I had here, well, uh, she was living with me about, I don't know, it's got to be about 15 years ago now. I uh, wanted a pet, and uh, I heard about this place. We went out there, and she adopted a pair of cockatiels. Uh, and when she moved to Duke University, she got her, her job up there, finally moved up there. I started going out and, and just kind of talking to Ron, trying to learn a little bit more about it, and uh, started helping him because he was a one-man band trying to do all this at the time. There's 400 birds, and he was doing all this himself. Wow. I started helping him. We started building things together. Uh, my nickname out there is the Scrounge because he would need something. Uh, for example, he said, I need some cinder blocks. I said, how many do you need? He said, as many as you can get. I said, that's not a very good answer. He said, what do you mean? I said, you need to be careful what you wish for. Uh, a week later on a Sunday, I have a one-ton Dodge Duel. You know, I showed up with it stacked up above the calf with brand new cinder blocks that were donated from a construction company uh, that just put up a new service station and they were going to just send the landfill. I went out and loaded the truck and uh, took it out there. So that's kind of been the, you know, again, we talked about before, you know, the, the misting systems. I found the UV filters, uh, you know, some of the stuff with the piping and, you know, the water systems, electrical systems and things like that. I'm uh, just kind of a resource for all of that. Well, that's, that's been kind of, well, obviously it is, but I'm thinking that you're way beyond the term uh, a resource. Basically, you're uh, you're a giver, you're a giver of heart, and you're a doer. You know, and peeps, like I was saying earlier, you know, there's not enough people on the planet like Bobby Cartwright, and what a beautiful example of following your heart and actually doing something with that beautiful magical spirit that we all have inside of ourselves of stepping up and taking the time to do something absolutely beautiful and wonderful for another life form on this planet. Um, and it's only, allowed, it's only allowed to have one of me on this planet. That's, that, yeah, that's universal law. There can only be one uh, other than that. Oh my. Let me throw one more, one more thing in there for you folks out there. Uh, show of hands, who's on Facebook? Okay, that's a few of you. Uh, <laughs> like that, right? I've been on radio before. That was yeah. good. I saw the video. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, remember Romper Room. Yeah. Um, if you go on, there is a Feathered Friends page on Facebook, Feathered Friends Forever. And also, if you want to have some entertainment, look for Oscar Eclectus. And Oscar's my little naked rescue bird. He was horribly abused, pulled out all his feathers. Uh, he's been here with me now. He's sitting in the background, in kind of in the sun, watching out the window, and kind of talking and falling asleep. He's trying to take a nap. And keeps hearing me talk, but uh, he's got a cell phone, and he and I text back and forth. Um, he's also got a number of uh, caption pictures in there, sharing some of his knowledge and some comedy for everybody. And we also put up. Um, I put a lot of the videos up there. We've got Sugar, the YouTube dancing to Thunderstruck and doing some other things. And then a bunch of uh, Fiona's pictures up there. She's the other eclectus. Sounds so, awesome. Featheredfriendsforever.org is a website. They have a Facebook page. And Oscar Eclectus is uh, another Facebook page. Just be sure to like it because he's getting close to a thousand. And he's really beginning to wonder because he never hit that magic thousand mark yet. Yeah. Did you say that the um, that you actually have a bird that has his own cell phone? That's Oscar. Yeah, he and I text back and forth. I do screenshots of his text. <laughs> um, like like yesterday, he asked me. He asked me. He said, "Because I'm not always in the house. If I'm out at the shop or something like that, he stays in the bird room." Uh, these guys have an 11 by 20 bird room. That two of the walls are bricks that attach to the house. The other two are full-size sliding patio doors um, so they have two whole walls of exterior view and it's low e glass plus it's got an extra tint an internal tint on it to keep the sun down and uh, they all have their own little house but the cages are not locked 
stuff on his perch. And I, I close his door. He kind of likes it that way. I don't latch it. I just pull it all the way closed. Oscar stays open. And then Stumpy, the little guy, the little Myers that was born without feet, um, he spent exactly three minutes inside his little cage. And I tried him in three different ones. He wanted nothing to do with it. So he's got a, a little perch place. He's actually sitting up there now. I put a little platform up way up in the corner of the room. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's got his own little night perch and his own food and water bowl on top of Oscar's cage. And they all get along fine. They're not, you know, they have their own little space when they want it and their great big space when they want to be out with everybody. That's fantastic. Bobby, I want to ask you this. Well, first of all, I want to thank you once again for for taking the time to be with us tonight and 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 sharing your magic uh, with the world, if you will, sir. Um, do you have any recommendations to others in order for them to have even a better relationship with their birds? Understand from the very beginning that you're dealing with a life form that is as smart as you are and doesn't show it. Uh, when you get in, you know, I mean, cockatiels and parakeets are pretty, you know, pretty easy to get along with. But when you start getting into, like, cockatoos, uh, grays, amazons, uh, and the birds like that, the ones that, that will talk your ear off or bite it off if they're in the mood, you have to understand that they are as smart as you are. Um, and I tell people, you know, especially the little kids, you know, can your bird talk? Yes. Can you fly? No. Then my bird is smarter than you are, um, because he can talk and fly. So (laughs) you have to understand that they have the same emotion set, the same emotional toolbox that you have. They have an intellect that's capable of making and using tools, solving puzzles, um, you know, and things that Formerly, you know, there was no differentiation between animal and human besides tools. Well, they've proven that all, most all animals can make these tools. Uh, these guys communicate. They don't just mimic. They'll actually hear a word and they'll use it in a conversation. Um, Casper was notorious for laughing at jokes before people got them out. Uh, I told Sugar yesterday I was going to trim his wings. He, you know, he walked up and got in the cage and wouldn't come out. I mentioning the fact that, okay, it's time to trim your wings. No, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I do the same uh, thing. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I want to take him outside. Uh, now, Oscar, when you go on Oscar Eclectus on Facebook, I just put a video up. He's He loves to play in the mailbox, and I don't know why, but I have about a 300-foot-long driveway, and he will get out, and he will walk his little naked butt all the way down that driveway, and he gets to the mailbox. Of course, he can't get up. And he turns and looks at me like, okay, boost. And he'll sit there and play in the mailbox. He got to meet the postman one day. Uh, and he just wants to hang out. And the cool part is he gets to meet the neighbors that way. So, um, uh-huh. yeah, they, they have their own little personalities. They don't forget things um, very easily. And they don't forgive very easily. That's the other thing to remember. You abuse a parent, you've made an enemy for life. Matter of fact, you've made two of them because I'm on his side. Um, Made three of them on there, too. Yeah. So, and you're going to get the other thing I tell people. You will, there is, doesn't matter what bird you get, unless you, you know, you will get bit at some point in time. You will get bit. Deal with it. Whether it's malicious or it's accidental. Um, sugar has a, has a plastic couple, <laughs> a, plastic, and a bunch of plastic bottles he loves to toss around and play with. Well, I wasn't paying attention yesterday. Yeah, that's your scissors. He just found the scissors first thing. They're about to disappear. <laughs> he just threw them right off his head. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, that's the wings, huh? Now he's happy. Uh, oh, I reached back. I was, I was petting Stumpy, the little guy with no feet. He threw the bottle behind me. I reached around behind it. He was back there. And he reached for the bottle the same time I did. He grabbed me by the thumb. He knew right away he had the wrong thing and let go. Uh, but... You know, you're going to get bit accidentally. You know, we tell people, if I have a bird on my shoulder, do not reach up and try to pet the bird because he's going to give me a warning bite on the face ear where he can get at to let me know somebody's approaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, learn everything you can. If you're thinking about adopting one of these little feathered geniuses, go online. Resources are incredible. Uh, learn everything you can about the species of the birds, what they like what they don't like, and then understand that every one of them has a personality that's completely different. Um, and then also understand that much like your significant other, if you have a relationship going on, and your kids, they're all going to come out different, and they're going to change over time. We've adopted birds out to to male 
particular person, much like you know, dogs always pick the alpha male in the house. Um, cats care less about anything, but the first one is a God, we both are. <laughs> sounds like to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, well, one more question, sure. and that is, do you have all of these birds right where they want you? No, that's not what I asked you. I said, do you have them all right where they want you? No, not quite. They're still they're still working on exactly what they want. Uh, Oscar, if if Oscar had his way, I would I would never leave the room. Okay, I I have a comforter thrown out here at midnight, or if I just want to take a nap, you know, stretch out, I'll come out here. They've got a radio that I turn on in the morning when I come home from work. Uh, turn that off at night. I put an, an LED TV up on the wall um, so they can watch, you know, Discovery Channel if there's a bird show on. And, um, you know, I, Oscar would just prefer I came out here and slept on the floor so he could sleep next to me. I stretched out last night. He got all snuggled in. was just kind of mad when I got up to go, you know, go to bed. It's like, well, wait a minute. You can stay here. Oh, yeah, wow. But uh, they're, uh, they're amazing companions. They are they are a lot of work uh, in that they're, you know, everything is a toy. Uh, they can be uber destructive. Uh, when Stumpy was free flying in the house before, uh, he would find an open bedroom door, get up on the, on the inside of the bedroom door, and he likes to chew. So I have to replace the top piece on all the moldings on all the doors in my house because he would sneak around in there you know, I was at work and he just had a little field day. And uh, yeah, so I've got, I've got molding to replace all that. And the interesting thing is, I have a picture of him in here. This is a small Myers parrot. He has no feet. He has no ability to hold on, okay? There's a trim strip that runs all the way around this room. It's three quarters of an inch and sticks out about that far. Mm -hmm. Okay, he has got one entire 11 foot red completely antique, as I call it. He flies up, he hooks his beak on that wood, takes one little, you know, chews so he gets a little piece out of it, then falls down, picks up his wings and does it again. He's working all the way around the room. He's an artist. Uh, it sounds like he's an artist he and he's working on he's more. working on a masterpiece. You want a bath? I'm sure he's just telling me he wants a bath. You want a bath? Um, the other thing you're gonna find, we don't know what it is is uh, vacuum cleaners. When you, you start a vacuum cleaner, all the cockatoos think it's rain. So I was like, wondering yeah. about that. When we vacuum, and I'm sure a, a, a number of other people have mentioned that to me as well, too, that why is it that when you turn the vacuum cleaner on, on all of a sudden, 
the babies want to go dive bombing into their bowls and yep. and and go swimming. So rain, huh? Is is your hit on this that it sounds like rain to them? It sounds like it sounds like it's raining. Yeah, it's got the same kind of frequency as a as a rainstorm. Bobby, you're brilliant, man, because I've been trying to figure that out for a country minute, man, and here you came up with it just like right off the top of your head. I love you, brother. I want to thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart for you spending the time with us tonight. Peeps, Bobby Courtright of Feathered Friends Forever, one of the most magnificent, intelligent people that I know on this planet. I'm not pulling any punches on this one, you guys. Bobby, thank you so very, very much. Piles of smiles to you, my brother, and have an absolutely fantastic day tomorrow. And I would definitely like to have you back. Oh, any, any time. And, and don't forget, folks, go to uh, Street Collect, just go to his page. Go to the FeatherFriendsForever.org and uh, sign up for, you know, for some of the vendors on there that help us and your, and your Kroger card. And for those of you that are auto racing fans or motor, motorsports fans, uh, Boo Boo, the one that travels with me, She's our motorsports liaison bird. Uh, she actually has her own business cards. She's been to Roush Shape. She's been to a number of races. And she is my crew chief on the race car. If you're on Facebook, it's Carolina Sprint Tour. That's our page for the organization that I race with. Okay. And uh, you'll see the new car when we, uh, when we get it out there. It's Wings for Wings Motorsports. We do this to uh, raise publicity. It says the car has a big wing on the top. The name was perfect. I love it. I love it. Bobby, thank you. Have you have a great day, and um, give all your, all your feathered friends a little snuggle for me. Yeah, absolutely, I will. Thank you, my brother, and good night. Good night. At IQ Air, we are committed to providing you with the best air purifiers in the world. And we back it up 100% with a simple, straightforward warranty. We ensure that your IQ Air Health Pro Series system meets or exceeds our quality guarantee. We also guarantee that your system is free from defects or we will fix or replace it for free. This includes everything. All you have to do is register your product within 30 days of purchase to be eligible for the 10-year limited warranty. This is our simple promise. We stand 100% behind the quality of our Swiss-made air purifiers so you can relax and breathe easily. IQ Air Limited Warranties apply only to IQ Air products purchased in North America directly from IQ North America Incorporated or from an IQ authorized dealer. Thank you.